Alrighty, hello everyone, welcome back to the PS Platypus. Today we're going to be taking on the pretty large task of going through all of the endocrine disorders um, that you're going to be expected to know for your exam. Everything except for diabetes. So let's take a look at them one by one and then explain what goes wrong in each of them and what we should expect in terms of signs and symptoms as well. So when it comes to um, endocrine disorders, we're going to be talking about imbalances that can occur in different hormones. So we'll be looking at growth hormone, having a look at excess of uh, growth hormone and how that results in either acromegaly or gigant gigantism, depending on when it occurs, um, and then a deficiency causing dwarfism. So as you can see in this little uh, page over here, I've tried to highlight all the different hormones we're going to be covering and what condition results from an excess of them, as well as a deficiency of them as well. So growth hormone, we've already got that. We've already talked about that. Thyroid hormone, we have hyper and hypothyroidism, parathyroid hormone, a similar thing. With the adrenal hormones, it's going to get a little bit more involved. So we're going to be taking a look at those one by one as well. Um, now, there are other conditions. So like I said before, we're not going to be covering type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but it's essentially an imbalance of insulin and um, its function. There's also pituitary hormones and conditions that relate to that are Sheehan syndrome and diabetes insipidus. They're not too high yield, but I would invite you to take a look at them um, in your own time, whether they cover that in your um, lectures or having a look at previous PSPs and, and having a look at their tables that they've put together that sort of go through all these conditions. I'll link to a couple of them um, at the end so you can take a look at those in your own time. But we're going to be covering the main uh, core important ones in those first few dot points um, in the next few slides. So let's start off with uh, growth hormone. So with growth hormone, I've got on the left there a bit of the normal physiology of growth hormone. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because uh, that would have been covered in a previous video. The important thing that we have to know, though, is what happens when you have an excess or deficiency of growth hormone. So when the growth hormone excess occurs prior to growth plate fusion, then your bones are still able to grow long and tall. And so you have this person um, experiencing uh, a large increase in their height. So they're going to be very, very tall. And that's shown in the, the diagram at the bottom there from Nettis where um, the person with gigantism is, is markedly taller than the physician. Um, acromegaly, on the other hand, is when the growth hormone excess presents um, post growth plate fusion. And as a result of that, rather than the bones being able to grow tall because you know they've already um, had the growth plates fused, instead of what you have is um, you have larger features so things are just growing um, bigger in terms of the hands and feet growing larger. And again, the buzzword here is spade shaped. So you'll often see in exams, rather than saying they might have larger feet or hands, they might instead use the word spade shape, which refers to them becoming much larger, wider, and bigger. Um, similarly, you also have um, you know, growths in the facial structures, so your nose, brow ridge, and so you have what's called a prognatic profile, which you can see down the bottom there. Um, and you also have uh, some hyperglycemia, and to understand that, you can have a look at the flow chart on the left there and see that growth hormone, one of its effects is to, um, metabolically is to decrease glucose uptake by muscles and also increase glucose output by liver by the liver and so you're going to have a bunch of glucose being dumped into the bloodstream and so you're going to have hyperglycemia um growth hormone deficiency on the other hand would result in a type of dwarfism known as larron's dwarfism the only really uh, important thing you have to know about this is um that it's surprisingly protective against diseases like cancer and diabetes so just keep that in mind for your exams and you'll be good Next up, we have thyroid hormone, definitely a very high yield important one that you have to know about. And that's where you have an excess or deficiency of the thyroid hormones, so T3 and T4. Um, now, when you have hyperthyroidism, that's when you have the excess. And that can come in two different types, so primary and secondary. And it's important that you know what you should expect on um, thyroid function tests, where you're testing for T3 and T4, as well as TSH H levels. So primary refers to a pathology at the level of the thyroid, whereas secondary refers to a pathology at the level of the anterior pituitary. And if you really were being a pedantic, we'd also say tertiary, which is um, at the level of the hypothalamus. We never really test for that with thyroid function tests immediately. So with a primary um, hyperthyroidism, what's happening here is the problem is at the level of the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is overproducing T3 and T4. And because your um, anterior pituitary would have some negative feedback against that, it would try and reduce TSH levels to, in turn, try and reduce the T3 and T4 being produced by a thyroid hormone that's aberrantly overproducing. Secondary instead, however, is where the problem's at the level of the anterior pituitary. 
And what's happening here is that the TSH being produced by the anterior pituitary is too much. And that in turn is going to make the thyroid gland overproduce T3 and T4. So we expect a rise in both of them rather than just um, T3 and T4. Um, and you can have a look at the same thing from hypothyroidism and see if you can figure out why the levels are as they're shown um, on the slide. Next up, we have the actual signs and symptoms that we expect. So with hyperthyroidism, we expect to see increases in metabolic activity. Um, and there's a bit of an error on the slides here, which I'll come to in a second. So with hyperthyroidism, hyper, we in expect increases in metabolic activity. So hyperreflexia, um, they're gonna feel a bit hot because it's increased basal metabolic rate um, and also very fatigued because the body's uh, you know, increasing its metabolic rate and that's gonna make them feel a bit more tired as well. Um, you're also gonna have an increase in sympathetic symptoms. So you're gonna see things like tachycardia, um, diarrhea, which is not really a sympathetic symptom, um, but it's caused by an increase in gut motility, which sounds a bit uh, strange because technically if you had increased sympathetic activity, you'd then um, expect to see a decrease in gut motility. So it's kind of the opposite. Just think of everything as being on overdrive and overactive. And that sort of explains why you have diarrhea rather than constipation with hypothyroidism. Um, and then you also have amenorrhea or lighter periods. Uh, again, this is a bit difficult to wrap your head around, but the way that I sort of memorize it is that you have a sympathetic overdrive. Um, and so your body is, if it's in fight or flight mode, it's going to prioritize uh, things like your blood sugar and getting that to rise and um, getting your pupils to dilate and things like that rather than reproduction. And so it's going to essentially have a um, reduction in the volume of your periods. And you're going to have lighter periods. You can also have other signs like palmar erythema, on uh, onycholysis. Um, but then when it comes to Graves' disease specifically, you're going to see some eye changes uh, that are very important to keep in mind. So that's exophthalmus. Um, and you're also going to see uh, a bunch of other eye changes that I've put down in the diagram there, which you can have a look at. Um, but another very important characteristic sign you're going to see is pretibial myxedema. So that's a non-pitting type of edema that you'll see um, above the tibia. Um, all right. And next up, we have hypothyroidism. And they're going to be already talked about primary and secondary and what that means. Now I'm going to come to the error on this slide, which is that instead of seeing an increase in metabolic activity, you'd see a decrease. So there should be a down arrow there. But the rest of it uh, sort of makes sense. You're going to have hyporeflexia instead of hyperreflexia. The person's going to feel a lot um, colder because they're not burning as much with their basal metabolic rate. And so two words we'll often see being thrown around is because with the hyperthyroid patient, they're going to feel a lot hotter. They're going to have heat intolerance, whereas the, um, the hypothyroid patient, because they're going to be uh, feeling a lot colder, they're going to have cold intolerance. And you might see um, the articles of clothing reflect that as well, which you can take, a, uh, take into account in your di differential diagnosis and in your clinical judgment process. Um, again, you're also going to have fatigue here as well as one of the symptoms. And instead of seeing increased sympathetic symptoms, you'll see a decrease in sympathetic symptoms. So instead, you're going to have bradycardia, constipation, and menorrhagia, so heavier periods. Um, and the up arrow there, again, for sympathetic symptoms, should be a down arrow instead. Um, and then you also have, besides that, pale palmar creases, deafness, psychomotor retardation. You have a bunch of other neuropathies as well. So you have um, carpal tunnel is one of them. Um, but we'll, the main ones are all on this slide. And keep them in mind for both your exams and your OSCEs. Another one that comes to mind as well is with hyperthyroidism, you tend to have uh, more sweaty, um, wet skin, um, whereas hypothyroid, so hyper was sweaty, whereas hypo is more dry skin, um, which is more brittle. And you also notice that the hair of the person is also a lot more dry and brittle. Um, and that's because it's not being as frequently replaced. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide then. Let's have a look at parathyroid hormone, which plays a very important role in regulating serum calcium and also bone health as well. So parathyroid hormone excess, we call that hyperparathyroidism. And that's where we, um, as a result of the action of parathyroid, get an increase in serum calcium called hypercalcemia. Now, a very nice way of remembering everything related to hypercalcemia is stones, bones, groans, and moans. So stones refers to the fact that you get renal stones, um, also called nephrolithiasis, but essentially you get 
these um, calcium deposits and precipitations in, in the kidneys, and that can cause colicky pain and everything associated with renal stones. You can also have uh, so that sort of flank pain. You can also have problems with your bones because again, the calcium is being pushed out of your bones um, into the blood. And so you're gonna have weaknesses in your bone developing and reduction in bone density. And so you're gonna have weaker and more tender bones, which you can often palpate during an exam. You're also gonna have uh, what's loosely termed groans, but essentially abdominal pain because that hypercalcemia uh, and the electrolyte imbalance actually um, results in a reduction in GI motility. And so you're gonna have a bit of constipation that results in the abdominal pain. You also have what's broadly termed psychological moans as well. Parathyroid hormone deficiency instead um, has results in a reduction in serum calcium and therefore hypocalcemia. And there's only really two important clinical signs you have to keep in mind for this one. There's a number of things, but the two main ones that they'll often ask you about is Trousseau's sign and Charkov's sign. So they both are signs um, of hypocalcemia. With Trousseau's signs, that's where you clamp their uh, a patient's arm using a blood pressure cuff, for example. Um, and then you expect to see after some time what's called a carpal pedal spasm, which you can see uh, with the way that the uh, person's hand would sort of twitch at the wrist um, and at the, carp uh, at the um, fingers as well. Um, the Charkov sign is where instead, if you tap someone's facial nerve, you expect to see a twitch in their jaw muscles. Um, so a muscle spasm there instead. And that's again, another sign of um, hypocalcemia. Essentially all the muscles get very twitchy um, in that scenario. Um, whereas with hyper, you get those muscles being um, less twitchy and therefore you get things like constipation because your gut muscles aren't being as active as they should be. Whereas with hypo, they're being a bit too active and, and um, over uh, stimulated. Um, we then come to the adrenal hormones and with these, you have a wide variety of conditions. Um, we're gonna start off with what happens when you have an excess level of glucocorticoids, so things like excess cortisol um, and the condition which you would have uh, covered time and time again when, it, uh, when you had a look at steroids and, and one of the side effects is Cushing's syndrome. So Cushing's um, can broadly be termed as Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease refers to when there's an ACTH producing anterior pituitary tumor, which in turn leads to increased production of glucocorticoids. Cushing's syndrome can refer to two, one of two things, either an exogenous source of glucocorticoids, like maybe you're taking steroids for pain relief, um, and that's causing um, a spike in the level of glucocorticoids, or an endogenous source. So that could be an ACTH producing peripheral tumor of, for example, the lung. And the effect of glucocorticoids like cortisol um, is to increase blood sugar. And the way I think of that is, uh, think about what cortisol is for. It's for the stress response. And when you're stressed, your body wants to really get energy out into, um, get energy available and ready for your cells to respond to that stress. And so what it does is it mobilizes um, glucose to be dumped into the bloodstream and available for your cells to use. Um, another interesting um, symptom though, is you get a bit of fat re redistribution as well. And um, a good way of sort of visualizing this is the image on the left there. You get what's called a, Muni, a Mooney's face, which is sort of a, a rounder um, face, central adiposity, and you can see that on the person in the image. And the way that you can sort of uh, differentiate this from just regular gain in weight uh, on examination is you'll see more red purple striae, um, which indicates that um, the connective tissue as well is being damaged. So that's another important clinical sign you can keep in mind. Um, and you also have hump neck due to fat redistribution to the back of the neck as well. Um, all right, that's uh, Cushing's. And then you also have um, a disruption of aldosterone. And when you have an increase in aldosterone, we, got, we get what's called Kohn syndrome. And because aldosterone's role is to increase uh, retention of water um, by increasing the reuptake of sodium, kidneys, what you're going to have is a high volume of water in your bloodstream. And so you're going to have hypertension, which is the main thing you want to really know about. Um, but you're also going to have hypokalemia because of the electrolyte exchanges that occur. So by taking in sodium and water, you have to exchange uh, potassium as well in the kidneys. And that goes out in the urine and you're left with hypokalemia in that person, which you might have to treat. 
Addison's is instead a uh, condition where you have a reduction in all of the adrenal hormones. So a reduction in both corticoids, a reduction in mineral corticoids like aldosterone, and also a reduction in androgens. So all three zones of your adrenal glands have reduced activity. And that's because it's a sort of an autoimmune disease where your body's attacking your adrenal glands. And so um, just across those three levels, you're gonna have a reduction um, in the hormones. So with low growth corticoids, you're going to have a reduced blood sugar. The person might feel faint, feeble, fatigue. Nice way of summarizing all those um, all those effects of low blood sugar. Um, with aldosterone being low, instead of water being retained at high levels, it's going to be actually um, uh, gotten rid of very very easily in urine. And so you're going to have low blood volume and therefore hypertension, um, and probably going to be more susceptible to things like standing up and and uh, being reduced. So um, let me say that again. So um, you're going to have hypotension, but um, you might often see that um, being observed in the clinical setting as postural hypotension. Um, and you also are going to have a bit of salt craving because if you're getting rid of lots of salt, um, then one way your body can compensate is to increase the hunger for salt so that you seek it out and replenish the body's uh, salt stores. You also have a reduction in androgens and the one sort of uh, thing that you can keep in mind here as the effect of that is a reduction in pubic hair. Um, all right, now we're gonna have a look at the next slide, which is gonna be covering congenital adrenal hyperplasia and um, phachromocytoma. I never know how to say that one, but it, I think it's phachromocytoma. Um, these are two also important conditions you have to keep in mind. So with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, it's important to know what the hormone that, or what's the enzyme actually was being affected. And in this case, it's a um, enzyme called 21 alpha hydroxylase, which helps with the development of androgens. So what's happening here is you have a reduction in that enzyme and therefore, um, sorry, they're gonna play an important role in producing things like corticoids and allosterone. But because that um, enzyme is low, you're gonna have a reduced production of corticoids and allosterone. Um, and instead, uh, the precursors are going to be shunted towards making androgens. And so you're going to have a high level of androgens and things like early puberty, postural hypertension, and in females, because you're going to have a high level of androgens, which normally shouldn't be there, you're going to have ambiguous genitals. The other thing you have to keep in mind is, although we're having an increase in androgens, we are having a decrease in two of the other hormones, so glucocorticoids and aldosterone. And so your pituitary glands will detect that and start to instead upregulate the secretion of ACTH to try and um, offset the effect of the reduction in those hormones. And so that's the negative feedback loop in play. And with an increased level of ACTH, you often get um, another sign, a clinical sign where you have skin pigmentation um, as a result of that. And that's another thing you can look out for in examination and also might come up in your, um, your written exams as well. With phachromosotoma, I don't really have much there for it. The only thing that um, I was really emphasized was that it's in essentially an overproduction of adrenaline. Um, and the main thing you have to keep uh, in mind here is you're going to have a lot more sympathetic activity. So think about all sympathetic, um, all sympathetic functions. They're all going to be upregulated. Um, and as a result of your body being in that fight or flight mode, it's gonna have, you're going to have a lot more anxiety, which is the psychological component of that condition as well. So that's a lot of content. Um, but the great thing about endocrinology is that the content follows very logically from um, the normal physiology. So if you understand the normal physiology and the way that everything normally works, it's pretty straightforward to get to what happens when you have an excess or deficiency of the hormones that are at play. So I'd advise if you really want to be able to consolidate this in preparation for your exams, um, take a look at your own Monash Physiology lectures. They're really, really well done and well made. I think they cover all the important content um, uh, and are sufficient on their own. But if you're looking for more exam specific stuff and stuff to keep in mind for when you're going through papers and when you're going through OSCE stations, take a look at our PS platform slides, so these ones here, and also our previous videos that we've made on these topics as well as having a look at previous movements and revision slides. I found that they were very, very helpful when I was trying to learn endocrinology. Um, and ultimately, when you have a look at all the content, it's really important that you can summarize it and put it in a way that you'll be able to look back at and use effectively for your exam revision. 
So one way that I did it was I draw a brief, a brief flow chart for each of the normal physiologies for each of the hormones. Um, and then um, for each of the diseases that arise from those hormones, talk about the key features, um, thinking about why they arise as well. And then once you can draw those flow charts, see if you can then do the same thing, but from memory so that you can actually develop that understanding all on your own without having to refer to your notes, um, which is what you're going to be doing in your exam as well. Um, and then see what you miss and just add that on. And then eventually you'll be able to get all those points without having to look at your notes at all, just from memory off the dome. Uh, and that'll be really helpful for um, your OSCEs as well. And then probably the most important thing is to practice with exam style questions. So with endocrinology, the most, uh, I guess, commonly used exam uh, question type is EMQs or extended multiple choice questions. So it's really important that you practice with those. Of course, previous Monash papers are the gold standard, but if you're looking for another, um, um, I guess, suitable resource, I recommend uh, having a look at a book called Clinical EMQs. You can find that on the Moon Moon Drive, or if you're not sure where to find it, let me know and I can direct you to it. It's also a very solid resource for this topic. Um, and I think it will do, um, do, do, do some really good practice for this section because it's got all the different connections that we discussed today. Um, but it uh, sort of forces you to link that up with um, the signs and symptoms um, rather than just learning the content, um, wrote learning the content. All right, so that's basically it for this um, topic. Just to sort of end this slide as well, I've included the type of um, notes that I made when I was writing this topic. So of course I had sort of a, a um, more um, well-structured laid out notes on my own um, computer typed up notes. But when it came to revising for the exam, it was really important that I was able to, without looking at those notes on the computer, be able to replicate them on paper. So the one way that I practice, and it might not be the most efficient way, I know you can do things like Anki and, and other sort of active recall methods. But one way that I really enjoyed and I found useful was being able to draw everything or write down everything that I had written in my notes from memory and then seeing if I missed anything. So you can see on the right there, there's quite a few things that on my first round through, I missed when it came to the signs and symptoms of different conditions. But once I identified them, it meant that it was a lot more obvious to me. And so when it came to exam revision, it was harder to forget those smaller points, which they might you know, pop up here and there in a multiple choice question. So that's it for this video. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, feedback, let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next one.